Hartlepool remains intact for now, and Summer is at least hinting a return. This time, I hope is the final episode from this welcoming County Durham port town, as I'm still working out available crew during this holiday season, Alan's steering wheel spins of its own accord. I thought I'd ease us in with a brief tour of other notable craft moored up nearby, some elderly Scandinavian charm, a look back to European wars two centuries back, something more industrious, and also a promising looking new project boat. Anyhow, I'm making progress in the stern end zone of the engine slash exhaust bay. It's totally open now and not helping the noise in the cabin. I need to box it in, but thoughtfully. So we've made a pretty good start. We've got these two plates which will go either side of this uh, stern section bay here, which I'm trying to now soundproof. And it's been foil edged and I can now go outside and use the TechSound low frequency insulation matting. If you can hear me over all the seagulls behind me, look at what I've made. I've made two of these blocks, a uh, port side one and a starboard side one. They are simply solid block of wood and then some mass loaded vinyl mat, a bit like you have on the rest of the engine cowling on either side. And then they can slot using friction into those two gaps and then I've left a floppy bit on each end and that will then sort of splay out onto the backing because there's a slightly uneven surface on the back so there's no point trying to match that um, match that profile so that will just then press up against the foam at the back and hopefully create not if not quite a seal about as close to one as I can get. So I went and did that and no, I didn't change my t-shirt that moment it was the next day. Before I get onto the main course let's deal with the hot air extraction ducting I installed a week or two ago. The fan near the exit does need some help, so I've got a vastly more powerful 12 volt unit to blow air from the entrance end and I've wired it up pretty straightforwardly. I'm trying to manage that age old task of fitting a square peg in a round hole. So luckily I've got all sorts of little offcuts and adapters and stuff from when I was putting in the main ducting work up there. So I'm going to try and find a way of mounting this here um, and allowing the air to come out of that rectangular output port there and into that. Um, circular duct. So there are all sorts of ways I could do it. I could either mount it on a bracket here or I could do a right angle here and mount it flat. I'll just try and work out what the best way is. I went with the right angle plan as its lower profile and self-fusing silicon tape has made a reasonable job of the change in shape. I'll secure it there firstly using friction fit into the circular fitting and then velcro for the fan onto the cowling surface. I'm blocking off the open end as I only have a T-junction not a right angle to hand. Now for the wiring. I'm going to keep it mercifully simple. I chose 12 volts this time and not the normal 24 volts as I'm connecting it directly to the alternator and therefore to the crank battery. It will spin up automatically whenever the engine crank switch is in the on position and of course when the engine is running. The fan's noise will remind me not to leave the switch on when it shouldn't be. And if I do need to take the fan offline it's a simple case of unplugging it. I'll show you the oomph this fan has as I did a quick test before installing it. Pretty impressive, and driving vastly more airflow than before. It's noisy, but that's okay as it's only from when the engine's running. So, a good start, but to the main event. To this day, Alan has been steering via an alarmingly conventional method, a steering wheel. Left hand down for left, and right hand down for right. Plus, the kind folk at Normar installed a rather loose-fitting emergency hand tiller for moments when wheels just aren't what we need or want. You push it back and forth, and Alan steers. But you lot have rightly demanded more for quite some time now. In the second unboxing in as many days, this is my new autopilot. These tiller pilots are some of the most argued about devices on online boating forums. What fun. And so from voiceover Alex to very smart Alan baseball cap wearing Alex. Okay, we're going to talk about autopilot. And it's something which I've done without obviously so far. But I remember even from the early days in the comments, people have said, when are you going to get autopilot? And there's been a big question mark about whether I get one that is tiller controlled, whether I get one that is a, a wheel control unit, or even some of the more powerful hydraulic ones. Obviously, once you start getting into that arena, we're talking about tens of thousands of pounds. And uh, I do need to work on something of a budget. Uh, what, what we do have luckily on board Allen um, is from its old proper lifeboat days, uh, an emergency tiller. And here it is. It doesn't stay on permanently, it just sort of slides on. And so you can um, avoid knocking your knee on this when you walk past, but it is there available for use. And it simply goes straight into the, into the vertical rudder post over there. And this moves with very, very low resistance, uh, left and right, all the way from full lock to full lock. 
and is going to be the obvious place for me to install the autopilot. And the one I've chosen is the Raymarine ST2000 Plus, which I gather is, for those who don't have unlimited budget, it's kind of the go-to option. As far as I can tell, in the UK we have the option of Raymarine, the near ubiquitous boat electrics outfitter, or Simrad, who I gather bought out the guys who first made these sorts of tiller pilots popular. Pelagic do appear as a smaller, more focused operation, but their pricier devices have a good reputation. But I know less about it, uh, although I was quite attracted by the fact that the remote control is a bit cheaper, because if you want to turn this into a remote controlled unit, it's pretty much the same money again. But we'll stick with manual uh, use at the moment, because I don't want to necessarily add too many bells and whistles. For those of you who are not entirely familiar, it's basically this big rod that sticks out here. There's a ram that pulls out to full lock in this direction and obviously retracts all the way inside. I gather this has got a better mechanical system inside than the cheaper versions you can buy and so it may have a bit more longevity. But people online, regardless of which manufacturer you go with, do tend to complain that they don't last forever. But you know, it's doing quite a lot of work. I can, I can live with that. So this fixes into um, a solid, I guess it's brass, um, little socket over here, which at the moment I've just set into this bit of wood. I'll explain that uh, in a second. And then there's a pin that drops down from the underneath of the ram end over here, and then that connects to the tiller. Now, you, you can't just connect it wherever you fancy, and that's a bit of a shame because it would be nice if you could sort of calibrate within the machine what distances you've chosen. They tell you, first of all, what distance there's got to be between the pivot point over here and where it connects to the tiller and also the distance between the center point and where that fixing is over there uh, you don't get to choose and that's there's some logic behind that of course the ram is a, is a particular length and so if you chose to have it too far forward or too far back the ram might either run out of space or only be working within a short range of its potential the second point being of course that if you put it too far up this way then the motor inside this is going to be working extra hard because it's not being able to use the moment uh, which it would be if it was a longer tiller distance because of course it's much easier to use the tiller out here than it is out here um, basic physics i do remember some of my level of physics so what i'm going to do is, is do a temporary installation because i'm not able because of those two distances and in particular this distance has to be exactly 18 inches I'm not able to mount it there, which is a pain because that would be really neat. Instead, I need to mount it here. So it needs to step off of the bench. And I'd like to do that using some nice proper steel fixings. And I don't have the ability to do complex steel work here in the marina. And so I'm just gonna do it like a temporary wooden one using the same holes I will use for the steel later on there. And then I can just replace that as and when. This, this is solid wood. I suspect it will do a perfectly good job in the meantime and it enables me to get the height right. This needs to be, of course, flat. You can't have it at this angle or at this angle. The thing that I've had to look at quite carefully is the distance here and where I measure that from. That 18 inches apparently is a critical distance. You can't just mess around and do it at 17 or 19. The tiller doesn't fit directly onto the top of the rudder post. It fits, um, and I'll show you a little cutaway now, of it being just to the side of it, it's basically clamped onto the side. So it's about an inch and a half away from the pivot point. Now, my mathematical skill ran out at that point and I couldn't work out whether I needed to adjust for that and maybe set the distance further for where there might be a, a sort of like an invisible pivot point just behind where the rudder post is. Anyhow, I called uh, a member of my family who is enormously better at this sort of thing than I have and he also had a set of dividers and a large sheet of paper on the, on the table and he was able over the phone to confirm with me that actually I don't need to worry about that I just need to take a distance of 18 inches directly from the top of the rudder post to the top of the, um, the tiller here and the point at which it is exactly 18 inches there that's where I drill. Uh, I was I think slightly overthinking it or I would argue just making trying to make sure that I wasn't going to make a mistake which I later regretted because once you drill this stainless that's kind of it. Um, I don't have another tiller. So I now need to put the whole thing together and then we can see whether it works. I will then do all the electrics up here and I'll show you how it all switches on. Um, it should then be more or less automatic. It's, it's designed to be a fairly low intervention unit and I'm hoping that, that means that when we're out on the water, it's not really for when I'm single handing because I do like to have crew on board for mooring reasons more than anything else because running lines forwards and backwards when you're also trying to control the boat is nightmarish on Alan. Uh, it's actually mainly so that I can um, not have to constantly spend my time up there adjusting for each wave as we go. 
this should be able to take a little bit of that work out of the system. And so if I'm up there, I could be navigating and not necessarily just concentrating on the C. Right, let's get on with it. Someone can probably tell me of an easier way of doing this, but I got as close to the critical distance as possible, and I didn't need to calculate to a theoretical pivot point after all. But in something of an update after real Alex has now handed back to voiceover Alex, this won't be my day-to-day -day tiller after all. I'm going to keep it back as the emergency tiller it was ordained to be. The tube within the tube fit is wildly loose. In fact, there's four millimeters of play. I doubt the manufacturers cared much about precision in steering here, let alone the foresight added an autopilot. But I'm still going to drill here at the correct point, because why not? It doesn't hurt to have the backup tiller set up and ready to do the job too, for the event that plan A is compromised. But I have a snugger fitting, narrower length of tube on order, along with the steel plate to mount the autopilot to. Also, the pin that comes with the autopilot has a little shoulder turned into its profile, and this needs to be securely adhered to the tiller. I gather that in most cases the latter will be wooden, for those with small sail and motorboats. My hollow tube here obviously isn't quite the same, so I need to fill the new tiller with resin, or wood, or something, so there's a proper bulk material there to set the pin into. Raymarine, a spare pin or two would have been quite useful. Okay, we're going to need some electricity. Luckily, there's already some at the stern, so we'll plumb into that. And all I need to do is make a little box to mount the supplied socket onto. In a normal cockpit install, this would be mounted through a fiberglass or wooden surface for the internal to external interface. I also need to leave a little extra space, as the native voltage is 24 volts here, and we need to convert that down to 12 volts for Alan's autopilot. It only draws half a handful of amps at most, so we need not go for anything too grand. I tested this module first, after last episode's treacherous chronicle of mislabeled converters. I've made a breakout gap from the electrical conduit that feeds the extraction fan, and run the wires out from there, and into a little cutout in the insulation that seats the socket rather neatly. I did check the wire gauge for the run all the way back to the batteries, and it's fine for the maximum number of amps we might draw. The voltage drop is only a couple of percent. I won't add any more devices to this particular branch of electrics though. At this stage, I'll just use the two power terminals on the rear of the socket, but the rest are for if I want to feed this onto a data backbone, which I currently don't as I'm happy using an iPad for nav, not a dedicated chart plotter. The iSailor software can interact with the Nemia ecosystem, but that's a job for another day. We are ready for a test, although with the caveat that nothing is rigidly seated in yet. I've left it in fixed mode, not automatic, so I can use the buttons to move the tiller in 1 or 10 degree increments, or hold down for going full lock to full lock. It seems to span the full extent of my rudder's range, and nothing gets snagged or angry, so that's pleasing. There's no reason to expect that the tiller swinging side to side wouldn't translate into corresponding movement in the rudder itself, and in the steering wheel, but we have high standards of filmmaking thoroughness aboard Alan. Indeed, verification and diligence to make a journalism ethics campaign a jump for joy. Left and right, left and right, round and round, and then back around the other way. I have more for you. Last time we were out on the water, especially on the rockier sections, having the side hatches open was a stomach saver, but also something of a hazard with occasional yet unpredictable fits of hatch slamming. I've long since known that a restraint of some sort was needed, but these need to be instantly releasable in case of emergency so no ropes, knots, bungees, or rigid locking arms. There are lots of friction or spring door restraints made in plastic or rubber for sale, but I tracked down a stainless steel one. The problem is that the shape of the shell and door mean there's only one location to mount it, and it's perilously close to the hinge. Grip strength is a concern, therefore. My only solution to date has been these rubber pads to make the opening bounces less jarring on the hatch hinges, and this is the corresponding ridge on the shell where that rubber pad settles and rubs. It's not a satisfying arrangement. I got straight to business and installed the recipient half of the catch, two four millimeter holes. I found some stainless screws to fit, and before doing the drilling, used a blob of quality sealant to locate it securely. This meant the drilling, addition of more sealant, and final tightening isn't gonna shift position easily. This is the solid stainless other half that's going to do the intruding. They clip together extremely securely when you're testing them by hand, but I'm sure that given their position, the act of opening and closing the hatch from the outer edge will be a serious force multiplier. Anyhow, I do have some faith, even if at this stage I'm already dreaming up an enhancement to make this work even in very rocky seas, when the hatches really, really want to slam shut on our elbows or our foreheads. I'm using the same procedure here, combining a good metal to fiberglass adhesive sealant and a mechanical fixing too. 
My enhancement idea is to pass a narrow drill bit through the whole pairing so that a retaining pin on a bit of cord can be slotted through and can lock the hatch open, but it can then be yanked back out in an instant if we need to close the hatch in a rush. Watch this space. Or hatch. Watch this hatch. But not too obsessively. I know how some of you can get. Some final rounding up news. I've bought some well regarded, let's call it rubber seal swelling potion. Apparently in the interim before I have the engine's flywheel off to change the front seal this winter, this might help reduce the very slow oil leak. Otherwise, I look forward to once again heading through these locks, out of the superbly helpful and friendly Hartlepool Marina as soon as possible. Crew allowing this week. The weather and waves are looking favourable for a two or three day leg. Cheers to the latest surge in those contributing to marina and travel fees, which are rather stacking up. Alan expects it. I appreciate it. Bye.